Chapter 96 Despite how much life had it out for you this year you were at long last pleasantly surprised by it once more, as things simply worked out, no ambushes, no shocking revelations, and no last-minute issues that changed your plans, it was kind of suspicious. But as you already walked among the rebels and former guards of Nora, you supposed that whatever happened in the background just wasn't worth the effort required to deal with it, since the shock tactic you had used to come this far had a limited amount of uses. Especially since the potential involvement of the Faith could have already drawn the eyes of the less savory individuals towards the Sept in hopes that the Faith finally lost the support of Nora's populace. Though whatever life planned to throw at you, your goals remained the same, so the assessment of Lord Palno was still required, or in other words, you wouldn't let yourself be stopped that easily. Though as you thought about your unprecedented misfortune you couldn't help but wonder who was truly responsible, since your master had mentioned that the gods apparently bickered between themselves for some reason. So perhaps you were actually seen as another agent in their games after your master had taken you as his vassal without any of the protection the gods had seemingly put onto House Lannister so that the old gods now screwed you over whenever they got the chance to do so without too much effort. You did kill a lot of what your lord had claimed to be religious fanatics, and you even now ultimately worked towards House Lannister's dominion over the Vale, so your current misfortune actually made a decent amount of sense, at least as far as gods go. The old gods had as far as you could see already given up on claiming the Vale for themselves quite some time ago, but gods weren't known for their wrath for nothing, so the ground of the Vale was probably about to be sorted, hopefully not literally. Though as you considered more standard conflicts that at the very least still meant that the remaining resources at their disposal would be used to make the victory taste as bitter as they could make it, which didn't mix well with your little quest for redemption. In the end, you swiftly pushed these thoughts away again and simply supposed once more that your mind had more immediate matters to attend to, as there was still a chance that a few of the armed lads around you would test their luck with you too and try something funny. The states of the houses you walked between had been getting better the closer you got to Watermoon, but there was only so much the captain of the guard could do to keep things in order. Especially since he at the same time continued to expand his ranks, it stood to reason that some rotten apples had still managed to make it past him. And besides, it would have been kind of pointless if you were to let down your guard just because the immediate surroundings seemed a bit safer than the districts of Nora that were ruled by the raider gangs. Though that being said it seemed like this as of yet unnamed captain of the guard has done quite the fine job, excluding of course the rebellion, but that was from everything you have heard so far still somewhat understandable. Not to the extent that you understood why most of the town was given over to little criminals, but you guessed that you weren't really in a position to judge. So you simply swallowed the thoughts that had again occupied your mind and instead observed the people around you, while the good old Barden smoothly talked the both of you through the camp till you stood a few meters before Watermoon's gates. Though despite your best efforts to fortify your mind against it beforehand, the smell created by the coating on Watermoon's lower walls and the gatehouse was still ten times worse than you had expected. Which meant that your good companion after you gave him some additional silver for his trouble had the pleasure to introduce you by his lonesome to the guard that was more than displeased to have opened the gate's window as you heard him curse. You had seen and so naturally smelled quite a few places as you had journeyed between continents, but even with your background, it was the first time in your life that you encountered something so vile that the simple act of breathing actually burned. In a weird way you found the complaints they made every now and again quite funny after you got a bit more distance between yourself and Watermoon, but as you suppressed another fit of coughs yourself, you simply wished that these old men would halve their profanities and get things moving. Well, you supposed that you at least found out why no further divine punishment was needed if this was what you would be breathing the next few hours, god damn it, even your eyes had begun to water. The people of Nora had done quite the good job if even just a tenth of that smell made it into House Palno's keep within Watermoon, but despite knowing their motivations, you still found yourself cursing them internally. Though by the time you had taken a decent look at the walls of Watermoon and the first gate opened to reveal the portcullis behind it, you could only ask yourself how a single harbour town could eat that much fish. But you soon refocused on your temporary companion as he said his goodbyes for the time being before he turned around and was gone. You felt like he actually wanted to enter the castle himself as he and the guard seemed to be acquainted. Yet you could nevertheless understand why he ultimately decided against it, as the good Lord Palno wasn't in a situation where a former knight could just remain unused. 
and while you personally had no interest in ever joining the priesthood or something similar, that didn't mean that you failed to understand his commitment to it, and taking up the sword wasn't what people joined the faith for in this day and age. So you simply entered and patiently waited for the two guards to close the gate so that the portcullis could be raised, and took your time to take in the castle house Palno had created over the ages. And for what it was worth you supposed the people hadn't overreacted if the inside of Watermoon reflected what it had looked like on the outside not that long ago as several beautifully whitewashed buildings and towers encircled the yard. If the outside of House Palno's decently sized seat of power wasn't literally covered in feces and what not you would even say that not even high nobles would have scoffed at being invited, there truly was no discernible reason to worry over appearances even if they decided to serve nothing but fish. Chapter 97 you were swiftly escorted to the young man you wished to see by two of Watermoon's knights, and Lord Palno was just that, young, he sat from what you could tell in the worst spot he could have been in as far as ages were concerned. Too young to demand any respect with his collected deeds and honours while he was just old enough that he naturally knew everything of importance in the world, probably much to the chagrin of his advisers and tutors alike. Though that being said, he nevertheless had the manners expected of his station, and it seemed that his mind contained enough common sense that he had still successfully managed to doubt his abilities after everything that happened. You took it as a good sign, as you understood that this truly wasn't a reaction often witnessed in this part of the world, as most of the rebellions that had broken out on Westeros in the past had pretty much always ended in one-sided bloodshed. And the few times when the bloodshed wasn't one-sided the realm ended up torn apart in legendary times of suffering, especially so when the rebellion involved the crown and with it the dragons of House Targaryen. Even the Starks and their vassals who were lauded as some of the most righteous lords in the realm would have probably put the rebels to the sword to secure order before they would have reflected upon what they had done wrong which Lord Palno apparently disagreed with, a good sign indeed. Greetings, my lord. Welcome to Watermoon. Lady Wadner, it's a pleasure to meet you, though I fear the first impression was a rather poor one, we hadn't expected your arrival for quite a few days else we would have provided you with an escort. No need to worry, my lord, I heard that quite a few places in the realm currently struggle a bit with the chaos, and the night I brought along has made sure I reached you safely. Speaking of escorts, might I inquire where your men and luggage currently are? so we can swiftly accommodate them. The men you're speaking of are as of yet still on the ship you were expecting, I was already in the Vale when I was tasked with representing the Westerlands and House Lannister in the Eyrie for the time being. Hmm, interesting, you have my thanks for the explanation, my lady. I'm glad that I could be of some help to you, though I have a question of my own concerning your city and its current state, since House Lannister might decide to support the Vale through Nora's harbour. So to get to the point and save the both of us some time, I would ask you what exactly House Palno can do, or plans to do in the future, to resolve the current situation? In truth I hadn't planned to do much of anything about it, the current chaos might have resulted in a lot of damage and suffering, but I don't see a way in which introducing armed knights into the situation would really improve it. I left our captain of the guard and some of his men out there to act as a neutral party that channeled their anger in a way that made it less volatile. I'm sure you can still smell what I'm referring to, but again, I have no desire to rekindle the fire. I hope you will forgive me if the words I'm about to speak are taken as an insult or something along those lines, but I heard this all started when you decided to renew the whitewash of Watermoon. It's a little difficult for me to associate this plan you apparently had with the words you spoke a moment ago, I hope you aren't playing me for a fool, my lord. I think your mistrust in this matter is understandable so I can't really take offence to what you said, my lady. Though while the plan behind why I ordered what I did was admittedly lacking, I'm not as maliciously incompetent as the results admittedly can make it seem. Well, it's not my place to question you about your quite clearly misbegotten plans, but please be so good and indulge me with your reasoning, I still can't grasp it. Well, your persistence is quite enticing, so I will indulge you with pleasure my lady. Even with half of it being reduced to rubble, Nora is actually as well if not better defended than it was before the mountain clans crawled out of their holes. So there was little reason to sizably reinforce the defences since they were always up to the task and the process of doing so would have taken so long that all preceding raids no matter their size would have long been dealt with. Here in Watermoon we still trust in how Saren's ability to defend the Vale, it was also why the refugees you probably saw before were let into Nora. Order will inevitably be restored, 
In the worst case the Crown would need to interfere and mayhaps they already decided to do so without our knowledge, but if you look at all of this without the fear these refugees hold things will work out. Which of course means that the task of House Palno, and with it my priorities are not the same as those of the small folk, there's no reason to please the gods for better fortune or reinforced defences of House Aaron Fields Knights while the Mountain Clans field glorified raiding parties. You speak of their invasion in a rather concerning mix between present and past, as if it was a problem but was also dealt with already, as I understand it you aren't concerned with the words of these refugees, but when was the last time you received information reliable enough to actually act upon, my lord? Do they truly seem so out of date to you? Well, I can see this matter has claimed your interest, and I suppose I would be quite the miserable host if I left this desire of yours unsated. Ignoring what we picked up from merchants and the like, the last official contact we had with the Erie happened when Lord Aaron instructed us to raise our banners with some basic information of what houses had already claimed contact with the mountain clans. If that's the case, would you be interested in learning some of what House Lannister picked up about the happenings in the Vale, my lord? You did indulge me, so it would be only fair if I did the same, no strings attached of course. Chapter 98 you were a bit undecided about the boy, on one hand the fact that he did pretty much anything with such a massive lack of information showed of confidence that he really shouldn't have. But on the other side he seemed at least on the surface quite reasonable if you ignored his trust to house Aaron, as the points he made about Nora's defences made a good bit of sense. For while he could have most certainly finished a good bit of the wall if he had started early, the fact was that the forests around Nora had more to offer than just wood so it would have probably turned out to be a waste in the long term. You understood his viewpoint, for such a hefty price there was indeed little reason to reinforce the wall as long as the unfinished parts of it would have to this day remained as a simple exploitable weakness that no one would pass up on. Especially so since House Palno hadn't lacked replacements while they still controlled the new and old populace of Nora, though while you understood the cost to gain ratio of the situation, it still seemed foolish. For while the surrounding woods were extremely important, especially for the next winter, the construction and maintenance of a more massive wall with cheap local materials would have also created more ways to earn a living that could have counteracted the increased labor pool. This all sounds more than a bit unbelievable, my lady. Agreed, but since when is the truth obligated to make sense to us, my lord? I understand what you mean, but how could mere tribes possibly deal the damage you described? This is quite literally unprecedented, my lady, House Aaron has fought entire wars against other great houses with a hundredth of these casualties. I planned to whitewash Watermoon and you to create an illusion of normality so that the little order we still had could be preserved, how should I have known that the situation has become this dire, why didn't the Aarons call for us? Well, I'm not familiar with the reasoning of Lord Aaron, my lord, but it is most likely that it all comes down to the strategy the mountain clans decided to employ. The mountain clans were at the beginning a good bit weaker than House Arryn, but since they happily sacrificed their weakest warriors and tons of resources early on to sow chaos and so cheaply diluted the Knights of the Vale all over the place, their troubles are understandable. And the very same strategy of the mountain clans was probably the reason House Palno never received further instructions from the areas the Arryns wouldn't have much use for your troops if their absence meant that another province would soon spew out more clansmen and refugees. In a way your forces are probably considered to be insignificant enough that just holding the lands and freeing up your direct neighbors in the process is all the troops of House Palno are good for. Please don't look at me like that, my lord, the mountain clans are here to stay, quite successfully so, thus just holding the lands of House Palno and so prevent the losses from recapturing said land later on is the logical decision, especially so since the clansmen are on average a good bit hardier than your forces. So what if they are hardier than might knights? Steel is still harder, my lady. Beautifully said, my lord, but on my way to Nora I actually came across some clansmen fully clad in plate, so steel alone won't grant you victory this time. Sigh, you have my thanks for telling me all this, do you wish that we send a message of your arrival in Nora to the Eyrie? It probably won't make it since the messages that received an actual response can be counted on both hands, but if you desire it nevertheless, I wouldn't mind sending one can be counted on both hands? I thought you said the last official contact with the Eyrie happened when Lord Aaron called his banners. And I spoke the truth, my lady, trust really isn't something that comes easy to you, does it? 
It's not the first time the Vale experienced large-scale raids, my lady, and Lord Arryn doesn't have the time to read all the messages that are coming in from every corner of the Vale, so he doesn't. Instead the letters are drained for every piece of information they contain which is then added to the war maps in the area and then receive a reply from the same officials responsible for the region in question with the broader strategies of House Arryn in mind. So just because a letter has the seal of House Arryn doesn't mean it's official, as they are most of the time a little bit mindless, if that makes sense, especially since details are purposely kept to a minimum to avoid leaks of information. These men and women that read and answer my letters are essentially tools Lord Aaron uses since he has only two hands and two eyes, the same way our little birdies just fill their role when we communicate. It's similar to how our feathered friends fly while these officials write and read, both happens without any input from our liege, a background function if you will, only something Lord Aaron orders them to write, like a specific message he dictates, or one of his direct orders is actually considered official. If you say so, my lord. My apologies for the tirade, I couldn't help myself, I simply quite dislike the thought of being seen as a liar, my lady. No worries, it happens to the best of us, some things just have a talent for getting under our skin. And no, there's no need to write a letter, I'm sure they're quite busy as things stand, and in the worst case it could even draw the eyes of the mountain clans onto your lands in addition to everything that has already happened. Though since House Arryn apparently left this region of the Vale to its own devices for the time being, what do you plan to do about the rebels, my lord? Still nothing, my lady, their anger is as far as I can tell simply misguided, so I can't justify to myself the use of enough force to make a difference. If Lord Arryn needed me and my men elsewhere I could do it, justify the bloodbath, but since my men aren't needed elsewhere I will simply wait till sanity returns to Nora on its own. Hmm. If you so desire you could accompany me to the Eyrie with some of your men when the time comes, it would probably help mend the anger of the populace, and you could get the newest information on the situation first hand. Chapter 99 You had to admit that you were quite intrigued with the little Lord Palno as he somehow managed to make his plans seem halfway decent despite their obvious failure. And you had quite literally never encountered a single lord on your journeys that had such a massive soft spot for the small folk, it was honestly endearing. So much so that you had even decided to alter your plan a little to see if some additional effort on your part couldn't improve his situation a bit after the cute and pure little lord had so readily helped your initial plan along. And while your master was hard to understand at times, from what you saw your liege wasn't the kind of person that would waste a perfectly good piece in the game for the throne, even if this particular piece was in dire need of some proper tutelage. Things should work out decently if you swiftly manage to make the boy see reason and come with you, so your master could get a good look at him. Especially so since Nora and its harbour with such an inexperienced lord and the population up in arms would make for the perfect staging ground, as the supplies sent to help the Vale naturally required adequate protection. Apologies, my lady, but my place is in my lands, so here I shall remain. Hmm, are you certain, my lord? There are many places in the Vale that could use your knights more than Nora, and a little preemptive action might be good for the morale of your men. I thought you were confident in the strength of your men, my lady, if you require additional strength for your escort, you just have to say it. He he, what confidence, but I would honestly pity anyone who decided to try their luck with the men of House Lannister, long before I would worry about lacking safety, my lord. Perhaps you will see it on our journey if you do decide to join us, but I genuinely doubt there is anyone in the Vale that could stop us from reaching the Eyrie. If you truly have such confidence in them, my lady, why are you still so insistent that I should join you? I already stated that I believe you and your men would be needed in the Eyrie, you could safely leave Watermoon in the hands of the captain of the guard, you did say that he was secretly acting on your behalf, yes? He does, and some additional knights are always useful, so I don't doubt Lord Arryn would have some tasks for us, but that doesn't answer what you would get out of that, my lady, the Lannisters aren't known to be very saintly in their rule. And I find myself doubting that has suddenly changed, since the whole realm knows of Lord Tywin's cold and calculating rule, so what do the Westerlands get out of my absence, what are the true goals the Rock pursues in my lands? The possibilities are nigh endless, my lord. It's indeed unlikely that House Lannister plans to support the Vale out of the goodness of Lord Tywin's heart, but since I never got the chance to meet them all, the possible gains the Lords of the Westerlands at large wish for are quite difficult to grasp. 
For the moment the duty I was charged with is to simply assess the damage the lands of House Arryn have suffered and to see how said damage has affected the economy. A task that can no longer be pursued in Nora as it's currently impossible to tell what events had changed the prices, the best I could do here would be to write down what the total collapse of the Vale's economy without the threat of winter to hold everything together looks like. So you're in truth a spy of sorts? Not at all, my lord, it's simply very difficult to act if what you hope to affect is on the other side of Westeros and on top of that in an unknown state. And despite their wealth and martial strength, the Lannisters currently can't afford to waste their strength, not as long as Lord Tywin and His Majesty would like to squeeze the life out of one another. Though the truth is that my tasks and my insistence as you had put it are not really connected, I simply hope that you would accompany me to the Eyrie since I feared that I might make a fool of myself and by extension House Lannister. And well, I believe you can imagine that Lord Tywin isn't the kind of lord that loves to give second chances, so since you had surprisingly turned out to be a fine and upstanding young gentleman with time to spare, I hoped that you might accompany me. You hadn't realized that the boy still harbored doubt about your intentions for most of your conversation, and that he actually brought them up just because you decided to push a little further than you had initially planned had caught you off guard. But you had learned to deflect such changes from your master, and since every good lie should hold a core of truth, you had managed to do so without much difficulty. You were sent to find out more about the state of their economy, everyone knew not to cross Lord Tywin and you were absolutely terrified that you would screw up and draw House Lannister's wrath onto you. Though the reaction you got as you played the part of the dejected puppy still astonished you as the boy that a moment before still stood proudly in front of you averted his gaze as he turned into a blushing mess. It seemed like someone had more than a few dreams about being the knight in shining armor, or perhaps he was actually embarrassed that he forced such a confession out of a cute twenty-two-year-old girl, but whatever it was, you loved it. There it finally was, the perfect opening, and you couldn't help yourself but have some fun now that the small but confident Lord Palno had turned into the fourteen or fifteen-year-old boy he was. So you naturally moved to capitalize on the opportunity as you were taught and swiftly used your looks and green eyes to recapture his attention as he failed to recompose himself while you closed the distance. Yes, you wanted him more and more on this little journey of yours, his reactions were just too adorable to pass up on, and he would be useful on top of that. This boy was truly the perfect little treasure. Chapter 100 You were still a bit surprised that Lord Palno's resistance had melted away as swiftly as it did, but you supposed it made sense, since the Vale and the North were probably the only places isolated enough for such purity and idealism to thrive. Though you weren't foolish enough to believe that his advisors could be swayed in the same manner, so you speedily reconstructed your innocent facade and quietly waited with the young lord in his chamber. There was after all still plenty of time to set everything up, and so you simply observed your newest companion's efforts to convince his men, till only two of his advisers still opposed the idea openly. Though from where you stood their concerns wouldn't be too hard to overcome as you could tell that they felt as if they just stumbled around in the dark. And it was clear that the feeling had only strengthened after they heard your description of what had happened to the veil, which took quite a bit of weight off your shoulders. For while they disagreed with his decision, they still acknowledged the need for more information, and so hadn't brought up his duty to the lands of House Palno to stop him. Which was great since such remarks if worded incorrectly could have easily insinuated things no Lord of the Vale would forgive being accused of, nor would their knights overlook them. And while you couldn't have cared less about their fates if they turned out to be incompetent enough to utter them, the fact remained that the opening you had created for yourself would have closed the moment they did so. For despite their messed up priorities, the stagnation, and sometimes outright incompetence, the fact that the vassals of House Arian upheld their duties to both land and liege no matter what remained an issue to be wary of. And while you doubted you would personally have any trouble as you were still a representative of House Lannister, you nevertheless understood that no one, especially not a group of nobles, should ever be underestimated because of something as deceiving as their past failures. Your master might be able to manipulate them at will and crush them and their castles in all manner of ways if they got in the way from the other side of the continent. But you very much so doubted any of that would save you if you stepped on the wrong toes in the coming weeks because you thought yourself better than them. Especially since the Vale was at the end of the day a realm ruled by might and not virtue with all the mountain clan raids, so much so that even the little Lord Palno had some decent skill with the sword if his tutors were anything to go by. And while he might have been cute under that shell of his, 
You had no doubt that House Palno would have returned to a state of prosperity on the day said show was no longer needed, though you supposed it actually depended on the decisions of your master now. Sigh, no matter how hard you tried, nothing of this felt right to you as the amount of stuff you had to consider slowly but surely pushed you into madness as you failed to comprehend these nobles again and again. One day you saw them as vain fools, the next one they felt just unbelievably incompetent as you listened to what the people of Nora had schemed behind the back of their lord. And just as swiftly your mind had reclassified them as threats and paragons of virtue at the same time after you had talked to one of the most inexperienced lords on Westeros for the fraction of a day, absolute madness. Mayhaps you had actually managed to displease your master, since this position that only one of those insane nobles could have ever desired and that you were honestly unqualified for seemed to only get worse the closer you got to your target. The saving grace of the situation was of course your newest and still innocent companion that occupied himself with paperwork, but you very much so doubted he would remain innocent for much longer once he saw with his own eyes what had become of his homeland. Though as the talks about the basic logistics of the journey carried on you soon found that your thoughts strayed farther and farther into depravity the more you observed the cute efforts of your little companion while you ignored the looks you were given as you did so. Hmm. Now that you thought about it, perhaps if you managed to convince your master that his true value actually lay somewhere else, in another profession than Lord since he undeniably lacked experience, then mayhaps, if you played your cards right, you might even be allowed to keep him under your wing. It sounded a bit insane since he had if you were brutally honest shown little promise as even the most powerful paragons of virtue still needed wills of steel and endurance to match said willpower to succeed. But while your mind couldn't help but doubt his abilities as you once more considered the current state of Nora, you still found that you desired a decent future for your little companion. And while you very much so doubted that the strain House Aaron's downfall would put onto House Palno's lands would hit him lightly, there were still opportunities in House Lannister's expansion. It felt a bit ridiculous that you changed from the best assassin in the realm to something alike to an overprotective friend, but while you were drawn to the boy, you also saw a bit of a chance to redeem yourself. Every tiny bit counted after all, and you had received a title and a nice bit of land from your master that you supposed still needed some additional people. And an agreement that allowed you to safely take your little treasure and his men with you to the Westerlands once House Aaron ceased to exist actually sounded like a halfway decent idea the longer you thought about it. The lords and culture of the Westerlands had probably their own unique kind of madness to them. But as long as your little Aston could be around you without his shell and these distracting busybodies that stared at you like madmen, you would be satisfied. For while there was still plenty of time to find something he has a talent for before the rock made its move, the fact that House Lannister had taken an interest in the lands of House Palno remained. And since it would be easier to take land that no longer belonged to anyone, it would be good if things were sorted out before the Lannisters desired more direct control over Nora. And once he was no longer connected to the lands of his house and Nora's harbour all reasons for your master or the gods to take an interest in you and Aston would swiftly vanish, and you would be free to do with him as you wished unbothered. You needed a moment till you fully realised how far your thoughts had strayed, but once you did, you just silently continued to observe Aston as he sent off the men that still remained in the chamber a little more conscious of their looks, something definitively wasn't right. Thanks for reading. In the next chapter we will once more change the point of view, this time to Darlin, as army's scribe. And to those who wonder, yes, I did turn Ina into a shot Aiken, focus on the turn. Ina desperately wanted to be of some use to Azami for quite some time, and the gods finally got up and actually did something. Though said interference comes at a price similar to the one of Marie's ability to communicate with them directly. Marie has what I would call sadistic bouts as her body tries to continuously shake off the influence of the gods upon her, while Ina got her brain rewired in exchange for some gifts that will make her a better assassin as the story progresses. I tried my best to write a bit of chapter 99 and most of chapter 100 in a way that should make it clear that her mental state is getting pretty messed up. But I'm still a bit unsure how good of a job I did with writing this rapid degradation of her mind and how much you guys liked or disliked it. So I would ask you guys for your opinions, did you find her change into a shot taken interesting, funny, or simply annoying?